Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Cradle News Roundup, your one-stop shop for all news West Asia. My name is Esteban Carrillo. I am the head of news for the Cradle. Joining me, as usual, are my colleagues, content creator and writer for the Cradle, Karim Shami, and columnist and editor for the Cradle, Charmin Narwani. So we had a very big weekend, a very uh, not unexpected weekend, but a very, very, very impressive uh, situation. What we just saw, Iran launched a huge and unprecedented retaliation against uh, Israel. And I say unprecedented, not for the destruction it caused, but for the, the, the power it put on display. You know, this was not uh, something that came uh, uh, surprisingly. This was something that a Gulf states, that the U.S. and that Israel had been warned about for a while now. Hundreds of drones, dozens of missiles uh, flying, you know, like uh, when I would see the images, like I kept getting, you know, the, the right of the Valkyries playing in my head. Because this just really seemed, you know, like uh, like them uh, flexing uh, their geopolitical muscle. As you said uh, a, a week or so ago, you're talking about uh, this uh, geopolitical striptease that Iran was doing. Saturday night, you know, it was the money shot. I think I want to introduce a moment of contemplation, an experience I had in 2000. 10, um, when I went to the south of Lebanon to meet with uh, Nabil Kaouk, who was the head of Hezbollah for the south at that time. And, you know, it, 2010 was four years after the 2006 Israeli war in Lebanon. So the discussion points of that war were still fresh. Um, the, the sort of thing all of the Western journalists were still writing about was uh, Hezbollah's missile capabilities, specifically talking about its medium-range missiles, and the new weapons it showed in that 2006 war. So, of course, I sort of fell in with this, and I asked uh, Nabil Kaouk, uh, what about medium-range missiles? You know, why didn't you use more of them? And he said something to me that really reverberated. He said, but we did use medium-range missiles. We used the, a few of them, and we used them sparingly. We used them to defuse the war. And I didn't even understand that concept initially. But when I did, I understood that these decades of being groomed by sort of Western wars, um, where if you win, if there's a scorched earth policy, if you've leveled everything, all their institutions, killed civilians, destroyed bases, you know, destroyed infrastructure, bridges, electrical plants, etc., that's not what a military is supposed to do. A military is supposed to be strategic in how it uses its, um, you know, cache of weaponry, its range of weaponry to protect itself, to set deterrence rules, and to retaliate lawfully. Because we do have the UN Charter, we do have the Geneva Conventions. The UN Charter essentially was set up, and the UN, to regulate... Um, and prevent warfare, okay? So Nabil Kouk says, we did use medium-range missiles. We used them to defuse the war, okay? Fast forward all these years later, and for anyone who expected, first of all, the same people who said uh, three days ago that Iran would never attack Israel are now saying, oh, what did Iran manage to do, right? So they're naysayers. Let's just accept this. Um, they're trying to double down on uh, on their perspective, worldview, agenda in the region. I believe that the Pentagon's strategists, watching what played out Saturday night into early Sunday morning, though not the ones who are ideologues, but those who are genuine military strategists, fell to their knees on this. Now, I, I'm not trying to be dramatic or over-exaggerate. They have forgotten how to wage wars, what a military is important for, you know, we know they're 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 top heavy. You know, a lot of conventional, massive hardware warships, um, fighter jets, etc. But these are easy targets in today's war. They watched an unbelievable, breathtaking military operation. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, Iran used its military very calculatingly in order to serve its political agenda. That's what militaries should be used for. Okay. First off, it went to the, after the April 1st strike by its consulate, it went to the UN Security Council immediately and requested a condemnation of Israel's strikes on its mm -hmm. diplomatic mission. It did not get it. 
Okay, so then Iran said, well, you hit our soil, our territory. We are within the rules of war and international law to retaliate. Okay, so they did these um, retaliatory strikes specifically against military targets, not civilian ones, as we've come to expect from every single Western war. Um, it flooded Israel's airspace and border states with hundreds of projectiles of different speed, firepower, maneuverability, okay? Not just the slow drones that took hours and hours to reach Israel proper, but, you know, um, missiles that could reach there within 6 or 15 minutes. Iran also used its old weapons systems, things that, you know, they, they didn't show their, the enemy anything new. Okay, they didn't show them anything new. They used old um, stocks. But, you know, it, it didn't use any weapons Israel didn't know about. It just used a lot of them. Okay, um, it gained incredible intelligence that night. It saw basically, I mean, it, 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 Iran now has a full map of Israel's missile defense system backs. Okay, that's it. Not only that, it also got to see which countries would jump in all in, all in to defend Israel. And the list was short. It was the U.S., the U.K., and France, all U.N. Security Council permanent members, all nuclear states. And then Jordan, because these guys needed an Arab or Muslim fig leaf to do this operation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Iran had warned pr prior to the strikes and the days leading up to it, all its neighbors, do not participate in this, okay? We will consider you a target. Mm. And they uh, obliged Iran. It was just Jordan, which is now taking a lot of flack for it. So the intel uh, that Iran gained from this is, I mean, it's it's a huge strategic cost to Israel. Mm. They used the arrows, the Thad systems, David Sling, the Iron Dome. I mean, everything. Like jets flying in the air. Yeah, Iran can now calculate which which uh, which fighter jets of you know Western powers will take off from Cyprus, which will take off from Jordan, or which will will any take off from Turkey, will any take off from the Gulf. Iran understands this now, you know, and it's going to be harder for these players to participate with Israel in a, a future future strike. Um, importantly, Iran did this alone, absolutely alone. Israel could not do this alone. It needed three nuclear powers plus the Arab fig leaf to do this. Um, the defense cost for Israel was $1.4 billion. Hmm. Iran spent about 2.5% of that that night. So Iran could conceivably do this for days and weeks, if not months. And what would happen? The Israel's alliance would be bankrupted, and it would lo it would be out of stock. Exactly, like because they're already we having economic wars. Yeah. What Yemen is doing in the Red Sea, and uh, so th th this seems to be the strategy, right? Because what Iran did was successfully hit its targets, was avoid civilian damage uh, and the casualties, uh, gain intelligence, as you're saying, and then hit the pocket of the Israelis because all of these missiles they cost millions of dollars to shoot. Yeah, now let's look at the actual physical outcome of the military operation. Um, what we do know, what we do know is that Iran struck three targets. The uh, Nevatim Air Base in the Negev, it's one of Israel's largest bases. Um, it's where they house the, um, uh, they, they store their F-35Is, which are the um, fighter jets that Israel modifies from the Lockheed Martin F-35s. Um, it has stealth fighters, transport and tanker and recon aircraft and Israel's Air Force One. Okay, so this is a major, major base. It hit um, uh, Nevatim. It, it also hit uh, Ramon Air Base in the Negev. And its third target was an Israeli intelligence um, center on Mount Hermon, which is north of the Golan Heights, the occupied Golan Heights. Where Hezbollah has been hitting for the past few months. Yes, yes. So, you know, what, do, what, do, what does the West say? What do the, the media say? We... Iran lost. We hit 99% of the incoming projectiles, okay? So let me ask you this. How did Iran manage to hit the three sites it wanted to, all three sites um, connected to Israel's illegal um, strike on Iran's consulate in Damascus? So all the other things in the air were decoys, okay? And Iran put on a great show. It got to really flex that night, but it had a very specific mission. So essentially, 
every single target it actually wanted was hit. On what level is this a fail? Doing and it did it without any allies. It it grabbed a hell of a lot of intel that night that it will use in all future strikes against Israel and its allies will use against Israel. Um, and, uh, you know... Uh, but just to highlight, you know, like, uh, because this thing about the 99%, we shut down 99%, it's spin. It's media spin. You know, and because you have the Wall Street Journal today saying that about half of all ballistic missiles that Iran fire at Israel failed to launch or crash before reaching their targets. You know, again, these are uh, like Orientalist narrative that you know that yeah. it's like uh, the, the savages launching. You know, they don't know who killed JFK. How do they know how many missiles like fell to the ground? Really? I mean, what are, they have people on the ground going into deserts and counting them. Really, it's so ridiculous. But let's also talk about the other things they're trying to prove. They, the the um, satellite shots of the Nevatim Air Base, right? Oh, look at this puny little hole in the runway Iran just hit. Listen, Iran wanted this to be a tap. Yeah. We can hit wherever we plan to hit. We can confuse you, confound you, um, drain you of money and weapons, uh, uh, intercept to, uh, interception mi- missiles um, in just a few hours, okay? And, uh, and, and control um, and script the event entirely ourselves. Mm-hmm. But don't forget those, the, the satellite pictures. I mean, the people believing these satellite pictures now are laughable. Do they not remember Hamas tunnels under Shifa Hospital and 36 hospitals that Israel bombed? Yeah. Do they not remember the cache of weapons in a maternity ward found in one of these hospitals? Even Western media criticized all these things. Do they not remember the elaborate blueprint of the Hamas command center, uh, you know, in Gaza City? You, the rendering, you mean the 3D rendering? The, the 3D rendering. Yeah. Do they not? A satellite map is the easiest thing to do, you know. And and they were kind of like, well, some clouds are obstructing it because their words, someone else will sh- will have a real satellite map and, 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 and show us. You know, but it's it's uh, the 99 intercept, uh, percent interception of it. Iranian weapons, how the hell do they know? They don't even know the weapons used. They can't even tell you to this date the list of what Iranian weapons used. But I just want to point out someone, um, someone who's written for the cradle before, Assad Abu Khalil, um, tweeted very nicely. He said, in 1991, when Saddam Hussein fired missiles on Israel, Israel declared an interception success rate of 95%. Later, an MIT study showed the success rate was about 5%. So let's take all of this with a great, massive pinch of salt. Exactly. Karim, what were you trying to... Uh... Yeah, I was trying to say that, they, of course, they will say 99% for various reasons. First, minimizing the attacks that Iran did against Israel, mm-hmm. and that will also uh, politically and militarily minimize the response of Israel because nobody wants to escalate. If they say they, they, they hit everything, they destroyed our bases, they killed the uh, people there, then the Israelis and the Zionists abroad also would demand a, a strict uh, response from Israel, which Israel can do alone also. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we know that Biden, uh, I don't know in this point if we believe them, believe him or no, but many many uh, news outlets, US out, uh, news outlets said that Biden said to Netanyahu that we, we will not participate in any attacks. And also because everybody now knows that, as my Sharmin mentioned, that uh, UK jets took, took off from uh, Cyprus and uh, today, today Macron said that uh, French jets took out from from Jordan, and we know that uh, Suncom and U.S. bases inside Jordan also participated in protecting Israel. So, uh, all these countries that consider themselves the leaders of the world, of course, they will say that without ninety nine percent, they will not let people accept that Iran is now an advanced state and it has like very precise missiles. So, of course, they would say that we down 99%. The 1% only hit Iran. Yeah. Oh, it is targets, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. And also, of course, they would say 99% because we saw many videos from Jordan of Iranian missiles uh, being downed and hitting some cities or some populated areas. And that's why when they, when they say that uh, they failed to launch, so they would put it on Iran. Oh, Iran don't know how to make missiles. Look, the missiles... It fell down in Iraq or Syria or Jordan. They are burning. They are dangerous. And this also will add legitimacy for Jordan to down any upcoming missiles. You say, look, Iran don't know how to launch missiles. Uh, they are falling on our ground. We have to shoot them down. But like, let's pause in Jordan for a second, you know, because Jordan, excuse, 
for shooting down these, these, these projectiles was that uh, these were unidentified flying objects flying yeah. over Jordan. You know, like Iran let everybody know, but no, well, Jordan apparently didn't get the memo. They didn't know what the hell it was. Um, they it also was, said that they were, they were um, shooting down these projectiles to protect Jordan, yes. which is the exact opposite of what it does. Opposite. Because then when you shoot down, when you intercept projectiles um, that are flying over your territory, they will fall on your territory. Yeah. If you don't shoot them down, they will fly over your territory and all will be safe. But then Jord the, Jord uh, the Jordanian government, you know, not content with taking this action. The next day, they called the Iranian ambassador for consultations, for protests, you know, because of these reports in Iranian media. Uh, in Fars News in particular, they were saying, you know, that Iran has uh, its eye on Jordan, you know, and for protecting the Zionist entity. So let, let, let's be clear, the entire Arab world and from what I've seen on social media, uh, um, you know, literally the entire world is just shocked at Jordan audacity, audacity to be the Arab and Muslim fig leaf for for, you know, an Israeli um, uh, an, an Israeli military operation. But, like, I've got to wonder, is King Abdullah II going through a midlife crisis of some kind? I mean, this is preceded by those very weird, awkward videos of, you know, him uh, playing little military uh, special forces games, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make him look really manly and, and, yeah. and, and cool. And, you know, in those videos, people were mocking that anyways. Now... It's intense. I, I just today I've seen two people tweeting that uh, King Abdullah's Twitter account blocked me. Ha ha ha! I mean, it, it's embarrassing. They're they're getting overwhelmed. He is getting overwhelmed. Let's see how this plays out. If Jordan will participate in what's to come. Yeah, and just to worth mentioning as well, you know, the situation internally in Jordan and is like this level of um, of of, uh, of censorship of of uh, government uh, persecution for pro-Palestine speech, for protests in Jordanian For wearing the kafia, for holding up the Cal Palestinian flag. They're really, really worried about those demonstrations they authorized initially that have become daily. And, uh, you know, I think over the Eid al-Fitr holiday, uh, 45 or 54, I can't remember, Jordanians are being held in prison over major Muslim holiday for protesting against Israel and for Palestine. And this is a country where between 50 to 60 percent of the population are of Palestinian origin. What is this king thinking? Yeah, well, I think the king, they have, he has like a crisis because... Midlife crisis. Midlife, and he had maybe from his early life, uh, we know that he participated uh, in, uh, uh, in Star Trek. I, I forgot where, where, where I, I saw it, but he's, they said that he begged them to, to act. So it's clear he, he likes to be a hero. But of course, he can't be a hero for Palestine and uh, for Arabs. But in this case, he, he's now a hero for this. I mean, let let him let him airdrop more aid supplies to Gaza. See what the reactions will be there. You know, more so fun. The man is pure cringe indeed. So okay, let's not backtrack as now. But, but it's like these Sandhurst Arabs. Do you know what I mean? I'm pretty sure Abdullah the Second went to Sandhurst. These Sandhurst Arabs are so embarrassing. It's Training British. at the UK military, yeah, yeah academy. They, 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 forever in their lives, they don military outfits and pose next to fighter jets and whatever. And, and this is the, he is a Sandhurst, a Sandhurst Arab through and through and wanted to play tough. It, it's kind of like, remember when Dukakis wore the helmet and, and stood in that tank and basically sunk his entire, um, candidacy for, for president. That's what Abdullah looked like on Saturday night and Sunday morning. My God. So, yes, I just wanted to go, I want us to go back a bit for Saturday morning because the Iranian operation did not start on Saturday night. It started uh, earlier in the day when the IRGC Navy uh, seized an Israeli uh, cargo vessel, the Portuguese flag MSC Ares, which is owned by Israeli billionaire Eyal Ofer and the Zodiac, mm -hmm. which is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think is Israel's biggest shipping uh, firm. So this ship is crossing the Strait of Hormuz, essentially off the coast of Dubai, yeah. and it gets nabbed by the by the Iranians, mm -hmm. and it's taken to Iran. And you know the Iranians have a they they, they say was a violating a territorial waters. They issued a a, a reason for doing this. They all just point that. Either. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's my point. But the real reason here is, um, Yemen has already closed off Red Sea shipping for Israel. 
So the, what have they been doing? They have been using the Indian Ocean, and they have been using the Strait of Hormuz. They have been using, you know, a, a corridor that is being established to run goods from Dubai to uh, to Israel. So uh, Iran starts the day by essentially saying, "This is not going to fly anymore. This is we are here, and we are going to start taking action against you." You know, is it, are we? Can we expect to see more action in the Strait of Hormuz? So, so I think you know. The reason the state of uh, the Strait of Hormuz was, was um, brought into play um, before the operation started was because this is the shipping chokehold for oil and gas through much of the world that the West needs, uh, Europe in particular. This is the biggest fear always of the West about Iran. Oh my gosh, it could block the state Strait of Hormuz, and then what happens? So Iran said, "You're so scared of this tap." You know, this is why I call it, I call Saturday night's operation a tap operation because it was literally tap your air base here, tap your air base there, tap your intel headquarters, all three that participated in the consular strike, tap the Strait of Hormoz, okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe there are other taps we haven't noticed yet, but will come to light. But it was just, don't forget, because um, overnight, if that strait is closed, I mean, forget like $100 barrel per oil, we're talking hundreds 400, 500, you can't get oil. You can't get oil. Yes. You know, uh, which is why a lot of countries are storing that. You know, there's massive storage has been happening the last decade or so, yeah. right? And so so, so this this was a tap up. Yeah, like OPEC Plus has been doing the whole, like, uh, you know, reducing production too. To, uh, oh, OPEC Plus. OPEC, OPEC Plus, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah, sometimes the accents mix. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about what comes next and what binds Israel's hands and where Israel feels that it can flex um, the limitations, the opportunities, the likelihoods. Um, and let's just start by this uh, tweet, this article by Ron Bergman, Ronan Bergman, a uh, veteran Israeli journalist, very close to Israeli intelligence and military, who said basically that if Israelis could have been in the war room, okay, hearing what was going on in there, four million Israelis would be at the airport ready to leave the country. What happened in that war room? Well, you, we can already tell what's happening outside of the war room, because as we are recording this right now, there's huge, huge divisions in the Israeli war cabinet. The, the former prime minister, Yair Lapid, is openly call, calling to bring down the government with the help of opposition leader Benny Gantz. Natural, uh, National Security Minister Itamar ben Givir is openly calling on Netanyahu to fire Yoav Galan, the defense minister. These people are at each other's throats. These, so the you know, meeting didn't go well. Exactly. It went horribly. Imagine how it must have been. So what we saw on Saturday was the result of what has been happening for two weeks since the attack in the, in the consulate in Damascus. Uh, we have known, you know, it's like, uh, again, to, to something you said a few weeks ago, Shermin, you know, how to boil a frog. That's what we've been seeing for the past two weeks. You know, the temperature rise, rise, rise under Israel's feet. The U.S. says they were not informed. You know, the Israelis also say they were not informed. They, they did not inform the U.S. about the attack in Damascus. They informed them afterwards and the U.S. flipped because the U.S. knew what was going to happen. The U.S. knew that Iran was going to have to retaliate. So what happened after Saturday? You have the U.S. telling uh, Joe Biden, telling Netanyahu over the phone, we will not participate in a counterattack against Iran. You know, that doesn't mean we will not facilitate whatever you decide to do. It just means we will not be the ones launching the planes and against Iran. Then you have the U.K., you have David Cameron saying, you know, please think well before taking any action to Israel, essentially telling them, do you need to retaliate? Take Austria. the win. This is exactly. what we're hearing. Take the exactly. win. Exactly. France saying the same, like the, all of, all of uh, Israel's allies are telling them, you know, they didn't kill, you know, 35,000 people. They didn't kill 100 people. They, they, you know, they hit what they needed to hit. They made it overwhelming. They made a show of force. They made you look like, like a punk. So take the win. Because what comes next is not a win for any of us. So you have this pressure coming from the West. You have internally the Israelis going against each other's throats. And then you have also, you know what happened at the UNSC? I just want to mention quickly, which, uh, you know, the UN Security Council uh, met uh, last night. And you had like a country like Russia being very, very uh, strong in their stance in, in support of Iran, being the one saying, 
this was a result of the attack in Damascus, there Western hypocrisy, uh, you know, what would you have done, essentially? You know, what if this was the U.S. embassy? What if this was the French embassy? So uh, what is Israel going to do next? Well, if, we, if suddenly, you know, if we take Gaza or Lebanon as an example, they're going to do whatever they want to do, and they're going to track their allies with them. I think Israel is its own worst enemy in every way possible. It will feel a compulsion to do something. This is its MO. For me, it's a trajectory it doesn't know how to get off because it's lost military sanity. It will strike um, or or seek to strike against Iran with its scorched earth policy, um, you know, mentality. Uh I now let's remember Iran has th this operation is called True Promise, and Iran promised to strike on Israel after the embassy fiasco on the UN Security Council, you know, nixed uh, resolution. Iran came through on its promise. Now Iran's promising if there's an Israeli strike that is um, significant, no, just if there's an Israeli strike on Iranian soil, it will re retaliate much harder. Now, imagine one thing that same military strategists are sitting in a room going, hang on, Israel and the U.S. need very quick, very hard battles and then stop, right? That's why they do the scorched earth, you know, uh, uh, way. Iran, on the other hand, wants a, a longer war of attrition that bleeds Israel of its deterrence capabilities, its stockpile of interception, missiles and becomes such a massive liability for all its current Arab friends and its Western allies. That too, which goes back to the boiling the, the frog. Literally, Iran's best case scenario is slowly bleed Israel. And Israel wants to jump in with an adversary that's willing to maybe three days in a row do like launches of drones and missiles. Well, what is it thinking? And I Israel, Iran will, we've seen in this mission on Saturday, Iran will retaliate in kind. You know, it won't go big. It'll Let's hit. do exactly the same. It'll do, well, it didn't hit an embassy, an Israeli no, embassy, so far, but it will hit very, very logical targets. Exactly. Okay. It would be a logical retaliation. Like, it would, but if Israel blows up a major Iranian military base, well, you know, hey. Bring it. They might assassinate uh, some Iranians. But I think but in I this warning, think... Iran has said, I mean, like, I have to think about whether it was a top official or not, um, like an a actual policy position or not. But Iran is saying not just territory, but our leaders are important yeah. um, operatives. Yeah, I understand. But this is the first time. And we, if Israel does it again uh, and uh, Iran retaliates in the same way, then it will become the new normal. But till now, it's the first time. This but but also, I think if that round, the, a new round happens, I do think the multipolar powers, Russia and China, and even countries like India and Turkey, that will jump in to mitigate the problem because what that people are going to sit back and let this happen. This is everyone's worst nightmare, and so in the end, it will be an Israel loss because they 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 will have, you know, the rules of engagement because of this will have changed so much. Iranian projectiles in Israeli skies. Iran's grooming Israel for preparedness for this in its future. I mean, Israel lost on 7 October. You know, they uh, haven't gotten the memo yet. Uh, Karim, the retaliation, you know, that uh, that is coming from Israel, we also need to keep in mind, we need to keep in mind Lebanon, and we need to keep in mind Rafa. So, you know, what do you see? What, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Now, uh, after Iran did, did this whole, you know, uh, display of force and hitting their, uh, successfully hitting military targets, what comes from Israel and what comes towards Lebanon and what comes towards Israel. Yes, I think nothing will change on the battlefield after this attack because Iran was clear that this was a response for uh, Israel targeting its consulate, not as a response for what's happening in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, Israel attacked alone. Mm -hmm. Israelis, even in the UN, uh, they are saying that we were attacked by the axis of evil, as they name it, and they also mentioned the Iraqi resistance and the Yemenis, but I am pretty sure uh, this attack was only solely from Iran, and the other faction, they released a statement supporting Iran, but they didn't actually target, uh, target Israel. And this is also a smart move from Iran, because if Hezbollah participated, or Iraq, or Yemen, so 
uh, maybe uh, Israel will retaliate in these countries, and that's what Iran doesn't want. Doesn't want to drag this uh, the access more into uh, target, uh, not uh, more to be targeted by the US or by, by USA. So it was a solely uh, operation. Be, yeah, it needed to be a, a, an Iranian response on its own. Yeah, right? it's, on, it's on, and it was as successful. Uh, just to go back when uh, about talking about ninety nine percent and how the West is perceiving pre- 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 what happened. Allah, we say that Israel failed on, uh, after October 7 and the 2006 war in Lebanon because Israel said that we want to destroy Hezbollah, and they didn't. And because Israel said that it wants to destroy Hamas in a few weeks or a few months, and it didn't. But now we are saying it's successful because Iran said that we want to target these bases that uh, were used to target our, uh, our consulate, and they targeted it. They were- That's why it's successful. People are are thinking that Iran sent sent all of this. They want to destroy Israel on one uh, on, on one law. One that, died, that's yeah. insane. Yeah. And because uh, Iran, for me, uh, unfortunately, it it it, uh, it, uh, it feels that 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 the, the UN and the international law is very important. I don't. It's, it is important, but your enemy, Violate. which violates it constantly since 1948, mm-hmm. and you are still hanging into it. So that's why Iran only targets mili- military in military bases, and that's why we only saw few videos because the Iran is said we didn't target populated areas, and we only target military bases. That's why we all the views are, are from far apart. Yeah. Populations and state governments around the world alike, um, Iran is appearing as a responsible state actor, and uh, Israel is appearing as a pariah. It's a theme we've discussed before. But this is part of Iran's um, long game, you know, to flip that dynamic where Iran was isolated and a pariah, called a pariah for so long. The the, the script has flipped entirely. Israel repeated that script last night at the UNSC. That's what I was wanted to say. You know, they were saying, you know, sanction Iran, uh, Iran no, is the Third Reich, uh, Nazis, Hitler, etc., etc. Because they care about the media and the propaganda more than the international law. Oh, and Israel was showing pictures of Iranian Al-Aqsa. missiles over Al-Aqsa Mosque, like, Iran's going to bomb the holiest site all of a sudden. Like, anything Israel and its American lackey say, you cannot believe anymore. You cannot believe after six months of, like, uh, you know, stuff filled yeah. in Gaza and, like, you know. A five-year-old uh, kid who plays, like, video game will know that the projectile was not going to Al-Aqsa Mosque. Yeah. And people often t- forget that Israel is a very small country and it's like a strip. And we have we have uh, uh, the West Bank, and Israel is is all about this strip from Haifa or northern Haifa uh, to Ashkelon to, to to the border of uh, with with the Gaza Strip, and the other the rest is uh, the desert. So of course, Israel is a country we can say it's like a cylinder. Okay, and the missiles are coming from here, so people. All the people of uh, the, that live inside the Israel saw the missiles, and most of them were uh, 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 the missiles that were intercepting the, uh, the yeah. Iranian. Yeah, the, the interceptors, the missiles that were intercepting the Iranian uh, missiles and, and drones. So Iran was not targeting the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and we see this often in also uh, Gulf media, uh, like four, or five years ago, Houthis or Ansallah were trying to target a base in Jeddah. And uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE made all this buzz that the Houthis were, were targeting Al Kaaba, mm-hmm. but uh, Saudi Arabia uh, like destroyed destroyed the missile before before targeting the Kaaba. And now Israel, the, the country that kills Muslims and especially Sunni Muslims, because the population of uh, of Palestine are, are um, the majority are Muslims now and, and the Sunni Muslims now they went to Taiwan and hold the video of their projectiles about the Aqsa Mosque and say, said, look, Iran is killing Muslims. Yeah. No, they, they, they want to extreme. They want, you know, they want to say Iran wants to destroy Al-Aqsa when it's, you know, Israeli uh, government policy to build the, the, the you know, like uh, the, third their belief, the third temple on Two like, a, no, I think it's the third temple. I think the third. Third. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like, uh, you know, in the rubble of Al-Aqsa. That's and also, like, oh. yeah, uh, regarding the panic that happened in Israel in the past two weeks, uh, we'll see who, who's in power now or who, who's like uh, have more confidence, the Iranians or the Israelis, because the Israelis in the last two weeks, they were panicking 
and their army was, was panicking and their cabinet was, was pa panicking while uh, the Iranians were not. And now we, we are uh, waiting, or not we are, the Israelis said that they will target, first they said that they were targeting Iran within 24 hours, and then they said and within 48 hours. And if we go now to Iran, I will see people are waiting for this because they want the Iranians to revenge again. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Israelis that were, right. were panicking and running and even uh, going outside of Israel, there's many pictures of the Bin Laden airport. So we'll see the difference between the Iranians and the, uh, and the Israelis. Yes, we're going to have to you know, keep an eye on it, see what's going to happen. This is changing almost by the hour, or at the very least it was over the weekend. But I think we can leave it off uh, right there for this week. Thank you all so much for joining us. We hope to see you next week. Please don't forget to subscribe, to drop a like, to follow us on X, on Instagram, on Telegram. And if you're feeling generous, to leave a donation on our Patreon. You will find uh, the articles we discussed today um, in the description below. For the Cradle News Roundup, my name is Esteban Carrillo. I have been joined by Karim Shami and Sharmin Narwani.